Um, thanks for coming out tonight to listen to me talk about uh, my experience with oyster farming in Texas. Um, I founded Barrier Beauties in 2020 with my father, Joe, and we are the second permanent cultivated oyster farm in Texas and the first to harvest Texas farm grown oysters. We lease uh, 9.74 acres in East Galveston Bay. And this overhead map will show you where our site is. So we're kind of 1,200 feet off the coast of Goat Island right over there. So that gives us some protection as a barrier island. Now, if you would have told me a couple of years ago that I'd be running an oyster company, I probably would not have believed you. I have a very unique background for an oyster farmer. Um, I'm Jewish and was raised kosher. So I grew up not eating any shellfish, including oysters. <laughs> so some of my first oysters were actually from our own crop. Um, but since then, I've tried many, many different types, and I really do love them just because they take on the flavor profile of so many different um, types of, you know, water that it's really cool to see all the different farms oysters. Now, if, um, in 2020, when the pandemic hit, everything changed for me as well as many others. Um, I was working at a hotel in Aspen, Colorado, which shut down. Uh, so I moved back to Houston and started looking for career change. Right around the same time, Texas Parks and Wildlife passed the regulations to start the Cultivated Oyster Mariculture Program, which is really just a fancy name for oyster farming or off-bottom aquaculture. My father was familiar with the concept of aquaculture farming through a friend in Florida and asked if I wanted to look into this new industry in Texas. So when I said yes, I did not realize that my whole life would become about oysters, but since that day it really has and it's just been a great journey. Cultivated oyster farming has been a way of growing oysters for many, many decades. Texas is actually the last Gulf state to legalize oyster farming. Um, and there are several main differences between farming oysters off wild reefs and private oyster farms. Traditional oyster farmers harvest from a natural reef using a dredge, while oyster farms use gear installed in the water to hold oysters. We can harvest year round because our oysters do not depend on seasonal spawning, while oyster farmers are held, to, well, sorry, wild oyster farmers are held to regulations regarding the month they can harvest and if Texas Parks and Wildlife decides to open the public reefs. We are also able to harvest at a smaller size, two and a half inches, while the wild oysters cannot be harvested until they three inches, uh, which is why so many people have the image of Gulf oysters being so large. Oysters grown in mariculture operations rely on seed oysters produced in a hatchery. So we have the ability to grow two different types of oysters. Um, the first is diploid oysters, and that is what you find in the wild. They are able to reproduce. And the second is triploid oysters. Those are grown out in a hatchery in a way that they don't spawn. So they give all of their energy to growing the meat inside of the shell rather than growing longer with less meat like wild oysters do. Um, we use both kinds, but a lot of farmers tend to choose just one based on their own opinions of how they've grown on their site. So for all of our spawns, I send about 300 wild Texas oysters to an out-of-state hatchery. The hatcheries use this broodstock to spawn around 1 million oysters and grow them out to a very small size. They then transfer them out to a grow out farm where they grow them from about one millimeter to six millimeters, um, which is otherwise known as R6 size. At this point, our team will drive out to the grow out farm and pick up the oysters to bring them back to our farm. Um, and the reason we drive is because the oysters are so delicate at this stage, we don't wanna risk um, shipping them and having any kind of delays or temperature issues. So here you can see um, a couple photos of the small seed. On the left, those silos, um, I would say there's about 2 million baby oysters in those silos, and that's the first part of the spawning process. Not all of those make them to the farm. Spawns typically are about 50 to 90% successful. And then in the middle, in the right, are uh, pictures of when they arrived at our farm. So we transport them really in just um, dry black bins and we put a wet towel over them to keep them properly hydrated. And they are on our farm as soon as we can get them 
uh, out there. So currently there are no operating hatcheries or grow out farms in Texas, which is why we send them out of state. Um, in the next year or so, there will be uh, at least one or two opening. And as the industry grows, there will be more and more opening. Of course, being Texas, there are very strict regulations regarding the genetic type of oysters that we can grow as they don't want a wild species to escape and have any kind of negative effect on the environment. Therefore, they've created a delineation line between bays because there are actually two different genetic oysters in Texas. This map shows how they've divided it into three areas. So only Eastern oysters produced at hatcheries along the Gulf of Mexico are allowed to be used in Texas. Northern stock oysters are defined as the oysters found in San Antonio Bay and areas north, uh, which includes us. And southern stock oysters are those found in upper and lower Laguna Madre. Aransas and Corpus Christi are actually considered mixing zones, so they can use um, northern and southern stock for their farms. A disease-free certification from a Texas Parks and Wildlife approved laboratory is required before oyster seed can be brought back into the state and placed on the farm, just to make sure that there are no issues with any diseases. By growing oysters in a semi-controlled environment, we have the ability to grow single oysters with a deep cup, while wild harvested oysters tend to be longer and clumped. These oysters are more desirable to restaurants and consumers, and this is why farmed oysters are typically served on the half shell and considered a more boutique product. Generally speaking, the oysters really just kind of grow themselves because they filter water to feed. Um, our job is to give them room to grow. We start by putting the R6 seed into four millimeter mesh bags. Um, and as they grow, we split them into more and more bags to keep the density low so that they have enough room to filter the water. We then move them from four millimeter to nine millimeter to 18 millimeter bags. During this growth process, we just continue splitting them into more and more bags. Right now, we have a little over a uh, thousand bags on our site. So on the left here, you can see me holding one of our Zapco bags. Um, each bag has a float on each side, which helps keep it on the top of the water column attached to the lines in the water. And then on the right, you can see um, the pictures of the bags when they're filled with oysters and on our farm. Of course. So are they, are they anchored or are they just, how do you keep them from drifting away? So there are clips right there. You can see um, that go on that line. Uh -huh. And that lateral line is connected to buoys, which are then connected to anchors in the ground. And I'll show you a video of how we do that. I know. <laughs> we do too. <laughs> um, so the permitting process is pretty extensive, mostly because of all the work that you have to do uh, before we could even apply for any permits. We had to find a site that worked for us logistically and had the right water conditions. Texas Parks and Wildlife has a very strict policy of not commenting on whether they'll think the site is good for growing oysters. They will only comment on if it meets their regulations, like it's 1,250 feet away from shore or 800 feet away from an oyster reef. So we looked at Copano Bay, Matagora Bay, and several sites in East Galveston Bay, and we ultimate, ultimately chose our site for several reasons. Uh, a lot of studies we looked at showed that East Galveston Bay has the right conditions for oyster restoration. Historically, East Galveston Bay has produced a lot of oysters, but over the past few years, hurricanes like Ike and Harvey have destroyed a lot of natural reefs. Secondly, we're somewhat protected by a barrier island, Goat Island, and are as close to the shore as we're allowed to be, which is 1,250 feet. Lastly, being from Houston, logistically, it just made sense for us to have a site where we could access easier. Um, once we chose the site coordinates, we had to do soil samples and side scan sonar data to confirm there was no seagrass or oyster reefs in the er area we chose. Um, and we had to do quite a bit of sampling each dot on this map shows you uh, a GPS coordinate of where we sampled. 
So we had to sample within our site as well as the 200 foot buffer. And then we had to do side scan center data in the 500 foot buffer. Um, our studies said it was going to be about two and a half to five feet. Um, and it's really closer to about four to eight feet, depending on the time. So um, we didn't have, uh, you know, it's hard to get that exact number because a lot of the studies are actually pretty old um, and they've changed a lot since the studies. Once we compiled um, the research on the site, I applied for a congressional permit through Texas Parks and Wildlife. Um, to attain the permit, they basically want to know your entire business plan and every type of gear you plan on using in the water. After the conditional permit was issued, I then applied for permits with the Coast Guard, the Army Corps, Texas General Land Office, and the Health Department. Um, all the agencies were very helpful, but there was a lot of communication between us because as one of the first people to go through this program, they actually had to edit a lot of their forms to get the information that they needed from us. And I had quite a few phone calls with Texas Parks and Wildlife and the other agencies on the phone together so that everyone could get on the same page moving forward. <laughs> so this is um, just a little video of how we did our site sampling. It's pretty simple. We hired an environmental firm um, and used two pieces of PVC pipe uh, with shovel tips on the end and we just pull up a, a piece of soil right out on there, you know, if it's silt, mud, and if we found any evidence of um, oysters. For example, we found a very calcified oyster shell that had clearly been dead for a while, but Texas Parks and Wildlife considered that an oyster feature. And therefore we had to move our GPS coordinates a bit to accommodate that. Um, after the, con sorry. <laughs> The entire permitting process took about 10 months. Once I received all the permits through the other agencies, I then went back to Texas Parks and Wildlife with those permits and they issued us a final cultivated oyster mariculture permit. We are farm G-002, so just the second farm. <laughs> While this whole process is going on, I had oysters growing at a hatchery at Auburn University and then growing out at a farm near there in Alabama. So I was working against a deadline to get the uh, seed planted at the R6 size that we wanted. I was not allowed to install any of the gear without the final permit, so I also had our farm installers waiting for me to get the permits and have a week of good enough weather where they could get out there and install everything they needed to. In the end, we received the final permit about two weeks uh, before we went to pick up the oyster seed, um, and the farm was inst installed just a week prior to that. So it all fell into place just in time. <laughs> um, here's a little video of how we installed the farm. So uh, first we used GPS to uh, get in the water and mark the boundaries of the entire site. And we put PVC in every spot where we were gonna drop an anchor. So you can see we're driving by and then those are the buoys perfectly lined up. Um, these yellow corner markers are required by the Coast Guard. They have lights, flashing lights on them for night, um, and they are on the four corners of our site. And it was actually really cool to see um, all these dolphins. Every day we were out there, came out to play and investigate the sounds. They were like super interested in um, the guys screwing the anchors into the ground and the noises they were making, they were swimming up right next to them, trying to play with them and stuff. It was, it was really cool. So we've been installing our farm in sections as we grow. Our lines are 100 feet long and spaced 25 feet apart. So every 25 feet, we would drop an anchor and then they would use scuba gear to get in the water and install those anchors. And once those anchors are in, they are pretty permanent. The anchors are attached to the buoys and then connected to the 100 foot lateral lines on top of the water column. And the lateral lines are the lines we use to clip our Zapco bags that hold our oysters onto. Currently we have about uh, three fourths of our farm built out. 
So this is the overhead layout that I had to submit to Texas Parks and Wildlife. Um, as part of my permit, we had to completely create the farm plan. And it looks complicated and busy, but most of those spaces are really just anchors, buoys, and lines. Um, they just want to know exactly where you're putting them. So Texas is actually one of the last states that still harvest oysters from natural reefs. The oysters found in our water have been a delicacy in the bay before settlers arrived. Native Americans supplemented their diet with oysters, and by the 1880s, Texas was the only state that shipped oysters by train to other regions, which was when the first oyster houses, or firms as they were called at the time, were established here. In 2008, Hurricane Ike dumped so much silt sediment and debris into Galveston Bay that half that the oysters on more than 8,000 acres of reef, roughly half the reefs in the bay, suffocated to death overnight. The bay went from supplying 80% of Texas oysters each year to just under a third. While the reefs were easily destroyed by the storm, it has taken years and more than $70 million so far just to rebuild 1,400 acres of these oyster beds. Nonprofits like the Nature Conservancy and Texas Sea Grant have been working really hard to rebuild these natural reefs. And while most of Texas oystering tradition was built upon its 49,000 acres of public reefs, there are also private leases. Today, there are around 40 private leases covering around 2,300 acres of reef. They are now controlled by just a few people, including the Woody family and the Hoholi family, both of whom also own two of Texas's largest oyster processing facilities. The Hoholi family owned Prestige Oysters and they are our main distributor. They were the first to serve our oysters at their restaurant Pier 6 in San Leon. Um, if you haven't been before, I highly recommend it. Everything is super fresh. It's right on the water um, and it's just a great atmosphere. So there are many positive benefits of oyster aquaculture. The creation of an oyster mariculture program is generating a new industry in Texas and will hopefully have a positive impact on businesses and local economies. Oysters have the ability to filter up to 50 gallons of water per day per oyster, helping with water quality in bays. Harvesting of cultured oysters can also be an alternative to harvesting wild oysters, giving the reef some time to rebuild. Um, oyster mariculture can also provide a very unique culinary experience for consumers as specific flavor profiles can be curated through specific cultivation techniques. So impacts of the oyster mariculture operations on the marine environment are very minimal. Regulations require that farms are sited certain distances away from sensitive habitats, such as oyster reefs, uh, seagrass, uh, bird, bird rookeries, and there are also stringent requirements for securing and maintaining equipment in the water to minimize any debris. There's minimal risk to natural oyster populations in terms of genetics due to the strict biosecurity protocols that I talked about. Oyster mariculture methods and equipment have been refined and used for many years around the world. Um, and oysters rely on naturally occurring microalgae for growth, so they don't require any extra food or nutrients added to the water. Because only off-bottom culture is allowed right now, there will be no significant impact to the bay bottom from the gear, as only pylons and anchors are placed in the bay bottom. So the type of equipment used in oyster mariculture has actually been used for decades in the United States and globally. Impacts on marine life, including sea turtles and mammals has not been identified as a problem because the lines are kept under tension and netting is not allowed. Um, they're also very strict about um, any kind of deterrence that you're allowed to use so that birds and everything can still go through the area. So as I mentioned at the beginning, we have about 1.5 million oysters on our farm. We planted our first crop of 560,000 oysters in October of 2021. We also planted three rounds of oysters in 2022. We're very happy with our water conditions as the oysters seem to be growing really healthy and fast. Our salinity levels stay really high, um, around 16 to 21, giving the oysters a nice briny flavor profile. We've actually seen that when the salinity levels drop a little, the taste can change and become a little bit sweeter as well. As far as working on the farm, we really have to take advantage of all the good weather days. We have issues working the farm when the winds are above 15 miles per hour 
it's just not safe for our employees to be bending over the boat and working with that heavy gear. Our operations are essentially divided into three different categories, harvesting, tumbling and splitting bags, farm maintenance. So our team has to really be able to multitask in order not to fall too far behind on all of our oysters. As our site is exposed to the winds, we have had some issues with the bags breaking off from the lines. And when this happens, our team will go out and look for the bags. We're very lucky that we've found um, essentially every bag that has fallen off the line because they tend to float right to the same area on Goat Island. Um, but it's a huge task to find the bags and put them back on the line because bags with mature oysters can weigh about 50 pounds or more. So it really is trial and error to find out what works best. Um, the oyster community is quite close and always willing to talk to other farmers about how they operate and what they, what gear they use and how they've changed things um, throughout their time period. But each oyster farm has such different water conditions that work, what works for one farm will not necessarily work for another farm. Tumbling and splitting oyster bags is another large part of what we do weekly. We have to keep the, uh, the density in the bags low so that they don't sink and the oysters have enough room to grow and get the nutrients they need by filtering water. So we try to keep the bags about a maximum of one fourth filled. We also bring our oyster bags to land to use uh, a tumbler. The tumbler helps us in two ways. It helps the oysters grow deeper cups with more meat uh, by chipping off the edges of the shell and that forces the oyster to grow deeper rather than longer. It also helps us separate oysters by size as they don't all grow at the same rate. As the oysters come out of the bottom of the tumbler, we sort them so that the bags that they go back in have oysters in the same size range. And that'll help us when we get to the harvesting side. So here is a picture of the tumble, tumbler, it's super simple. You push them in on one side and they come out on the other. Um, we actually have two different sized tubes. So we have one tube with smaller round holes on it so that these smaller oysters don't just fall through the holes. And then we have a larger tube uh, for more mature oysters. Lastly, and most importantly, is harvesting. <laughs> and there are quite a few uh, strict health department regulations that need to be followed. So we have to keep extremely detailed records on temperature, harvest dates, deliveries. Um, we have an inspection every month by the health department to make sure we are following the regulations and our HACCP plan. HACCP stands for Hazard Analysis and Critical Control Points. In our HACCP plan, I identified each point where a possible hazard could occur and what corrective actions we will take if there are any issues or deviations. And that plan has to be updated um, yearly and resubmitted. So once we harvest our oysters, we package them in mesh bags in 100 counts. Before the oysters can leave our facility, um, they do have to go down to a certain temperature, which is uh, the minimum temperature they um, sorry, the maximum temperature they can be is 50 degrees to ship out. We have a refrigerated van we use for delivery so that the oysters stay properly cooled and to prevent any issues. So one of the hardest parts of running the farm has been um, just being subject to mother nature uh, and having that completely out of our control. There are so many factors like wind and rainfall that affect our oysters and the way that we operate. So as I mentioned, we really do have to utilize all the good weather days that we have. So far in the past six months, the health department unfortunately has shut down our bay TX01 twice. In early December, there were several, several norovirus cases that were traced back to oysters harvested in TX01. Um, and that goes back to keeping the detailed records so that they can find out when an illness happens exactly how and why. By law, the health department had to close down the bay for a minimum of 21 days before they would test the water again to reopen, even though they said they expected it to be cleared up within a week. 
We were not allowed to harvest oysters, even though none of the illnesses were traced back to oysters from our farm. They were all wild oysters. There was no way to figure out how or when the virus got into the water, as it could have been any person who was ill passing through the area. After the 21 days, they retested the water and it was cleared, so we were able to start harvesting again. Now, the way that these closures affect us versus the wild oyster farmers is very different. Um, we still had to go out and maintain our farm every single day. So we were spending time and money, but we were not able to sell any product. Wild oyster farmers had the ability to go to a different open bay and fish there. So while it did have a ne negative effect on many oystermen due to the large recall issued, they were still able to go sell product. Just last week, there were elevated levels of bacteria in TXO1, our bay, although no illnesses reported. They actually went back out today to retest the water and expect to have it open by Sunday. The health department believed these elevated levels were due to extremely high winds and um, heavy rain rainfall that pushed a lot of the water out of the bay. So as you can see, Mother Nature, we are completely subject to. <laughs> so in the future, our goal is to be able to grow about 1 million oysters per acre which would put us at about 10 million oysters a year. Because we were able to plant three different crops in 2022, this will allow us to harvest oysters year round in 2023. Um, and we'll also have the option to be selling larger and smaller sized oysters uh, because they will all be in different growth phases. Um, and what I've found is that every single person has their own opinion on oysters. So one restaurant is going to love the large oysters and one is going to hate the large oysters. So we're trying to provide, um, you know, a, a product for everybody. Um, currently, we're mainly only in the Galveston and Houston market. Our oysters have been at great restaurants such as Pier 6, La Lucha here in Houston, several restaurants in Florida, and now in five different Papa's locations in Houston. We aim to expand more in the Houston and Galveston market as we can deliver oysters that are um, harvested within the past 24 hours, so they are super fresh being served at the restaurants. Overall, although there have been many challenges, we're very happy with our oysters. This has been a huge learning experience, and every day we learn something new or have to pivot to using different gear. So we really have to be ready to make a change um, quickly. <laughs> but I enjoy the fast paced work and I love that we're providing a sustainable product to the market. I think Texas has the potential to have a very large mariculture operation. There are now three operating farms and um, quite a few going through the permitting process as well. Of course, part of the challenge for this new industry is consumer education. While most chefs are aware of the differences between farmed and wild oysters, once they are on your plate, most consumers will not know the difference. There's a certain image of large Gulf oysters and ours are very different from that because of the various techniques that I talked about. Many people are very surprised when they saw our oysters compared to wild Texas oysters. So to end with, I'll show you some photos of what they look like throughout the growth process and how they look when they're served on the hot shell. So these are all within the first few months of growth. Um, you can see compared to a water bottle top, you know, they're very tiny right there and they continue to grow. Um, the two that I'm holding in my hand right there, the stripe on them is actually a genetic factor because these are triploid oysters. Um, so that was just a genetic factor in the spawn that we did. This is what they look like. This was one of uh, the first bags that we harvested. Um, and it's really just super simple. We cut the mesh bags, measure them out so that we have the right size and put the oysters in them and then stick them in our fridge. And here are a few photos of how they've been served before. Um, on the half shell with Tabasco sauce and um, Gatlin's Barbecue actually uh, roasted them and they were really delicious that way as well.
Thank you. I wish I could have brought some for you tonight. Um, so I'll go ahead and stop there. I hope this has given you a better idea of what goes on behind the scenes to bring all these farmed oysters to your table, not just at our farm and here in Texas, but throughout the US and Canada. Um, it, it's quite a lot of work to get them to the table, but uh, it's a great product and it's a great alternative for wild oysters. So when it's a perception is farmed by farm fish, people say, oh, you're on a wild caught fish versus farm fish. Yeah. That? Um, so far, yeah, it's, it's through events like this, um, going and talking to the restaurants and having the servers have the knowledge so that when they're serving these oysters, they can talk about the process that's used and that it's all natural, that they're not fed in a different way or held in a tank. You know, they are in the ocean growing on their natural um, food. So it really is just consumer education. Exactly. There's there's a certain image, a negative image associated with the word, you know, farming in the ocean. Um, and this is just the complete opposite of that. It has extremely positive effects for the environment um, compared to, you know, salmon farming, which isn't always as positive effects on the environment. What's the, what's the, um, gestation period? What is that? What's the term? How long does it take from the time you pick the little bitty? Yeah. So we planted our first crop in October 21 and, uh, harvested our first crop in June, July of 2022. So about seven months and you know at first the ones that were ready for harvest were there it was a small amounts um but now you know the ones that we have that have been in the water for um a little over a year uh they're all about three inches so they've been ready for harvest for a while but we just kind of let them grow a little bit more um as we are expanding still so good question. <laughs> Pearls are actually formed by the mud getting into the oyster on the bottom of the ocean. So farmed oysters, it's, it's very, very rare to find a pearl in them. Yes. Um, so you have some sort of small oysters and stuff. If they all start the same size, do they just grow at different rates? Yes. You know, we haven't found any reason that they grow at different rates now. You know, it's just kind of, yeah. <laughs> You've got your early bloomers and your late bloomers. <laughs> No, because first of all, of course, that would the other farm would always be at risk of being shut down as well. Um, but it's an extremely uh, long process, and it does require quite a bit of upfront money before you can see any profit. Obviously, you know, it takes seven months to just sell the oysters, and ten months on top of that for permitting. Then the fees you have to pay to all the agencies. So we have not considered looking at another site. <laughs> if it expands, if there are perimeter that you have now, if you wanted to and grow it and stay in the area, but just expand it? Or... So for our site, um, we wouldn't really be able to expand it much just due to the fact that there are a lot of wild oyster reefs around us. So we're pretty much... Um, it was like playing a jigsaw puzzle to find a space that would work because, you know, we can't be close to any oil wells, even they, if they are abandoned. And there are quite a few in East Galveston Bay. <laughs> so our site is the largest we could get it right there. Um, also, right now, Texas Parks and Wildlife does not allow you to expand your site. You actually have to go through the entire permitting process again and start another lease. So technically it would be a different farm. And you lease the, you lease this from who? Is it from Texas Parks and Wildlife, uh, Texas General Land Office, 
um, Army Corps, uh, the Coast Guard. They're all leaseholders? Yes, okay. we we owe fees to all of them. Wow. Yeah. Yes. So what's the most challenging, like the permitting process or the dealing with natural disasters? Or what, what would you I would say it's dealing with weather um, and employees. Um, you know, we're located on Port Bolivar, which is a ferry ride from Galveston. And to be honest, we did not realize how hard it would be to get employees from Galveston to come out to Port Bolivar um, because the ferry is pretty inconsistent. Um, you know, sometimes they'll have four running and you can get on in 10 minutes and sometimes there are two hour waits. So that has really um, made it difficult for us to hire. We've had a lot of hiring challenges. Yes. So that's a great question. Um, nothing that we know of currently, but I was actually just approached by an environmental firm who um, is in the process of trying to get a grant to do some research like that to find out why, you know, our oysters were not affected by the virus while wild oysters were. Um, and so by doing that, we'll put some sensors in the water, we'll keep track of the oysters growth, um, a variety of other things that I I can't speak to the details of yet. I'm just not sure. Um, but that is one thing that we are going to start looking at. Do you know if it's common that farm oysters cause less problems than wild oysters? Or if there's not a lot of data on that? I don't think there's much data on that, really. Yeah. Um, in the past 10 years, the norovirus has closed down bays twice. So it's really not that common um, to close for norovirus. You know, closing for elevated levels of bacteria due to heavy rainfall and winds is more common. Um, and that, you know, they'll usually reopen within a week. Um, but norovirus, I, I believe in Texas, it's closed down base twice in the past 10 years. Like twice in the past month? <laughs> well, technically once in the past month and then bacteria for the second closure. Honestly, you know, everyone says that oysters grow slower in colder water. Um, I don't think our water gets cool enough to really slow down their growth at all. You know, the oysters we planted in October, um, they were ready for harvest in seven, eight months, which is incredibly fast, and they were growing throughout the winter. But, you know, winters here are so mild that um, it really didn't affect the, the rate of it. But farms up on the Northeast are highly, highly affected by this. It can take them like two years to grow a full-size oyster. So it's much more of an issue for them than it is for us, we're seeing. How did the weather, the, that freeze that we had as well, and I guess it did freeze in Dallas as well, mm -hmm. since they're sitting kind of on top of the water, did they get cold? <laughs> Um, we have not seen any mortality from that freeze now. Yeah. We actually see more, mortal more mortality in the summer when it gets extremely hot. We will stop tumbling them um, and try to just leave them be because the heat is so intense for them that when you the more you handle them, the more risk there is for mortality. How often do you tumble it's hard to keep it on a consistent schedule. Um, there's a saying in the oyster world that if you're not behind, then you're doing something wrong. <laughs> um, so, but we try to tumble them first when we're moving them from four millimeter to nine millimeter bags. And then the earliest we would tumble them after that is 30 days. And typically the most tumbles we will try to do is three in the whole lifespan of the oyster before we harvest. What's the response been like from chefs and restaurants? You mentioned some pretty big name places that are in the front. Yeah, chefs and restaurants have been super excited. Um, it has been a tougher sell than we thought because 
as a boutique oyster, they are a bit more expensive than the wild Texas oysters. Um, so it is a push to, like I talked about with the consumers, to get the consumers to understand this and be willing to pay a little bit higher price um, for a more boutique product. What kind of differences would you compare to like Northern Oyster, Blue Point, stuff like that? Those are typically more expensive. So yeah, those are more expensive than ours. Um, so it's not that way different. No, it's really like if you see a lot of consumers will look at the menu and they'll see, um, you know, East Coast oysters at a certain price and our oysters at that same or close price point um, and choose the Eastern oysters because they think in their head that it's a better product. But really, you know, it's it's. Um, the same type of product, just a different flavor. Um, you know, ours aren't gigantic oysters that you're used to seeing. So, you know, if we put them next to Eastern oysters, they actually look very, very similar. I like Texas wines. We have an image. Yes. <laughs> Texas wines <are> imported. Is <laughs> <laughs> it for inch and have similar challenges or is this just kind of a Texas thing? So far, I haven't heard of farmers in other state really having that challenge. I think part of it stems from the fact that Texas is one of the last Gulf states to still allow um, public oyster farming. Most other states don't allow it, so their only options are farmed oysters or oysters from another region. Um, I'm sorry. So public oyster farm, what does that mean? Does that mean like I can go out and go and get oysters wherever I find them? No. Only in bays that are um, opened by Texas Parks and Wildlife, mm -hmm. and they use their own metrics to decide if they think there's enough harvestable size oysters to open up that bay. Okay. Right now, I think there are only about three or four bays open out of about 15, um, and it's a huge debate in the oyster community between Texas Parks and Wildlife and the wild oyster farmers. Um, and, you know, like I talked about, there are the private reefs, uh, which only the people that own them can farm. And they actually spend money rebuilding their own reefs. Um, they do put a lot of oyster shell back onto their own reefs so that they will keep growing and keep providing a product. Is there a lot of available area to do the public oysters from oncoming waves? You can keep the spleen and be kind of in check like that. Is that? Yeah, that's definitely what farmers are looking for. They're looking for the right salinity levels and um, the right conditions in the bay. So uh, the other farms that are operating, um, one is in Copano Bay, um, and they have struggled a lot with their salinity levels. So even though they have really calm water and it's easier for them to work the farm, uh, their salinity levels were about like, seven when they planted the oysters. We actually worked together on our first spawn. So they planted them at the same time as us. Our salinity levels were about 20 at that time. And the farm that they were coming from uh, in Alabama had salinity levels around 20. So um, I'm sorry. It's better to have it higher. It is better to have higher salinity. And it actually helps prevent disease as well because salt is kind of a, a natural healer. Salt is good. <laughs> Yes. So if you have oysters that are, are you know, baby oysters that are growing in the 20s and you put them in the heaven, like uh, that can kill a fish, would it kill an oyster by drastically changing that point? Yes, it will. Okay. They just get shocked. Um, when they're that tiny, they are very, very sensitive um, to their habitat. And that's why we don't ever ship them. Like I talked about, you know, we the process of getting to the point where they can go on our farm is about at least six months um, and a lot of paperwork. Um, <laughs> so right now we uh, have used spawns from Auburn, Alabama and um, Biloxi, Mississippi. But I send out, I send out wild oysters, wild Texas oysters to them. And then they use that broodstock to spawn. Um, so, you know, for example, the 
the farms and hatcheries in Mississippi, they can grow other types of oysters, um, but they had to get approved by Texas Parks and Wildlife to grow ours. And they had to um, create a system where they were separated from any other different type of genetic oyster. So the silos that I showed you in that photo, that was all for our spawn. Um, it was just Texas oysters. No other oysters were allowed to be commingled with them. So some hatcheries and farms don't want to work with us because of that. Um, but some of them do because there are no hatcheries in Texas. So right, right away, you've got three farms in Texas that need oyster seed. I'm just curious. It's like a little rough there, but I don't know. How does that happen? Uh, so that is very scientific, and I couldn't get into the exact details. <laughs> um, there's two ways of spawning them, though. One is uh, chemically inducing them, um, and the other, I forget what they call it, but there's two ways of inducing them to spawn. It's a very scientific, yeah, method. So it's it's hard for me to describe because I don't understand the science behind that part of it as well. You know, my focus is much more on the farm side. Never thought about it. I mean, a lot of oysters have never thought about it. Yeah. <laughs> What's the difference between a rock oyster? You know, the oysters that grow on a rock that you find is like this to be able to, so people who could, you know, have maybe a panel of people. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. No, we're definitely trying to hold more events like that in Houston um, to just like I talked about, get the consumer knowledge that these are a very different product than what you are used to seeing in Texas. Awesome. Well, thank you. This has been really super fun. Thank you. Really I'm so fun. glad everyone came out. Yeah. I don't know if we made to this, but why did you pick the location that you chose? So we picked it because it has the right water conditions, like I talked about. And then logistically, like being from Houston, it just kind of made sense for us to find a site where we could get to in about an hour and a half, um, rather than, for example, Copano or Matagora Bay, which would take, you know, four or five hours to get down there if we needed to, and would probably would have required a, a move on, on my part. Did you view like multiple areas? Yes, we looked at several different bays and several different sites in um, East Galveston Bay. And ultimately it came down to uh, how close we could be to shore, um, and just kind of like playing a jigsaw puzzle of being far enough away from the reefs and oil pipelines and everything like that that the all the departments require. About recreational boating and things like that, where you are, do you get a lot of traffic? Actually, yes, we do. Um, <laughs> we are in a spot which I did not know this when we picked the spot, but apparently it's very popular with fishermen. Um, <laughs> Very familiar with that spot. Yes. But um, studies have shown that oyster farms actually increase the fish population in the area just because the water the fil they filter. Um, so whenever fishermen, we have a lot of people that drive by and are like, you know, what is all of this? They have no idea what it is. So, you know, they'll stop and they'll talk to our team out there on the boat. And, you know, we tell them, you know, legally they have the right to drive through our site we cannot tell anyone that you're not allowed to have access through our site and we do have channels for boats to go through um but we do tell everyone that we talk to it's best for you to just go around because there's a lot of submerged gear and it can hurt our gear but also it can kill your engine and <laughs> damage your boat if you are getting caught up in an anchor and chains and stuff like that. Um, there, it seemed, I think there was one event where it seems like a boat came through and kind of knocked something out of place. I can't remember exactly what it was. It wasn't significant enough to cause a huge problem, but you know, most people see it and um, they don't even want to go through it because of all they want, everything they see. So we've been lucky. Yeah. Yeah. When you have a customer, is that when you harvest, or I say you have to harvest at a certain time and you we find a customer? Or no, there... we only harvest when we have orders. So because when we they're going to keep growing and growing. Though. 
Yeah, but we have seen that right now they're about that three inch size. And as they've hit that size, their growth seems to have slowed a little bit. And that could be the fact that they're triploid oysters. So they're, you know, genetically different than the diploid oysters. And um, sometimes the spawns just have certain qualities that you can't really explain or understand. It's just genetics. Um, so we have ha seen the growth slow when, we, when it's gotten to that size, but we will not take them out of the water for harvest unless we have orders. Because if we take them out of the water to harvest, um, they'll die if we don't sell them. And then we're just wasting product.